Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I would just like to briefly just give a brief overview about the legacy of the late Nobel laureate, Professor Wangari Madai. And I would like to say that the late Nobel laureate, Professor Wangari Madai, was a woman of exceptional and outstanding personality. Her love and passion for forestry, particularly the environment and forestry in particular, was inspired by her childhood life. She was born and brought up in a rural setting in central Kenya, where her parents lived close to a natural forest. And going by her own words, she learned to appreciate the value and the role of forests, particularly with regard to the provision of the fresh air and the clean water. And besides, she also said that there was that provision of fuel wood for energy and for cooking. During her childhood days, she did participate in assisting her mother in fetching water, clean water from the forest, and also getting the fuel wood for that. However, as most of you know, she did not specialize in forestry. As a matter of fact, she studied in a totally different area, she studied zoology and veterinary science for which she was awarded and appointed the first female professor, African professor in Kenya and East Africa. However, she did go back to her passion in the mid-1970s when she realized that the environment where she was brought up was changing and changing for the worse. And this was caused by the government converting part of the natural forest where she had been brought up and replacing it with exotic trees, which were now denying the communities the very good services, particularly the clean water, as well as the firewood and the fuel wood. The population again was also growing, and there was that particular challenge of trying to access fuel wood for the women. So in the mid-1970s, she went uh, and established a non-governmental uh, organization, the Green Bear Movement, where she registered and enlisted quite a number of women. They began to plant, uh, uh, establish nurseries for planting trees, seedlings, which they used to supply, she used to supply to the women. First of all, to be able to plant on their own farms with the hope that they would be able to get fuel wood, and of course even clean air, from their own farms, and therefore they would not become agents of destruction and degradation of the forest. The development partners recognized that particular opportunity and went on board to support the Green Belt movement. And this particular movement spread in the country from central Kenya to the rest of the country. I'd like to say that the Green Belt movement is still strong, is still growing. Of course, not at the same level at which it was when she was still alive, but that's a legacy. And of course, she was much more focused on planting indigenous trees for purpose of restoration of our forests and for purpose of trying to ensure that our environment is sustainably managed. The second area that she came on board is when staying in Nairobi, she realized that the government of the day at one point was beginning to encroach on some of the public services and particularly the, uh, the parks. The government, at one point in the 80s and 90s, wanted to uh, annex part of the park and uh, build skyscrapers. She knew that people and urban dwellers are going to miss out in terms of the fresh air, in terms of the recreational facilities. What she did, she mobilized people, and particularly women, to stand up against the government of the day and say that this is an important area where people needed facilities for recreation as well as for purpose of resting. She suffered for that at one point. She was humiliated. She was beaten up, but she stood her ground. And I would like to say that through her effort, one of these public parks is still standing and serving the public good for which it was meant. The other area that she did come on board is that in Nairobi we are having one natural forest in the midst of the city. It's called Karura Forest. And again, the leadership in the government at one point 
greed for purpose of trying to acquire property, we are uh, accessing, we are trying to encroach to this particular forest. It's an area that's between the main city and the UN headquarters, UNEP and ICRAF. She stood her ground, mobilized people, and particularly women, to oppose. Again, she suffered for it. She was humiliated and beaten, but she stood her ground. I would like to say that today, we are having that forest properly secured. It has been fenced with electric fence, and we're having the international community supporting it, Friends of Karura. We owe a lot to her. I'm therefore very happy when I was actually invited to participate as a, a jurist in identifying someone who shares the legacy of Wangari Madai. And I was very happy, together with my other colleagues in the jury, to identify, and Martha Corozo was identified as one who shared that particular legacy. It is my pleasure, and I'm very happy that she's here today. Thank you very much.